There you have it. Mike McFadden is the Republican endorsed candidate for U.S. Senate. Now we're moving on to endorse a governor's candidate. Uh, there's a lot of excitement here. As I said, people have been up late last night, but they're ready to do it. We'll keep you in touch with everything that happens. This is Minnesota State Representative David Fitzsimmons. David, are you having a good convention so far? Uh, you know, it's been a marathon, but it's the one people will talk about all the time. So there's there's something to enjoy the experience. You've with. been uh, pretty active in, in Republican uh, politics. and Have you seen conventions that, and endorsements that have taken this long? I uh, this this may be the longest. I don't know if it's ever adjourned uh, recess before and come back, but uh, but there's been some marathons before. Uh, there's been, I think, more balloting, although I'm not sure if there's ever been a, as long an amount of time before. Yes. And then now we have another race. <laughs> so we're going on uh, 16 hours, as you said. We have people are here till 2:30, 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, now we're going to be endorsing the governor's candidate. What effect do you think that the, the lengthy U.S. Senate endorsement is going to have? Because, I mean, we're all humans here. People get tired. Right. If this goes on late into the night or to the early morning, are people going to take off? And what effect is that going to have on the governor endorsement? Well, I think a lot of it is going to be decided on the first ballot. If, the, uh, you know, there's four candidates. Many are saying there's three that have really competed for the endorsement and, and are going to be, uh, you know, competitive. Uh, if they're very bunched up and close, it, it could still be a long time. If there's a lot of spread, I think, uh, you know, these uh, conventions have a tend to momentum move things in one direction. So, As a uh, as a sitting state representative, do you try to stay out of some of the endorsement parts, or do you have a favorite in the governor's race? Uh, you know, I, in the governor's race, I don't know, but in the, uh, uh, in the Senate race, I was helping Mike McFadden, and, uh, you know, we were really proud of what we were able to do, and I think he's... Uh, uh, you know, going to help our uh, our state party uh, raise the funds it needs to take on Al Franken and uh, and turn Minnesota red. How much money do you estimate that a U.S. Senate candidate needs to to compete with Al Franken? Uh, I mean, the money that the candidates and outside groups spent in the uh, in the original uh, Coleman Coleman Franken uh, race was, I believe, somewhere in the neighborhood of forty million dollars. So. But both candidates combined and, and on both sides. So it's a significant amount of money. I think the candidate in the campaign itself is going to have to get, you know, close to $10 million. Mm -hmm. Well, David Fitzsimmons, thank you for your time. It's good seeing you. All right. Thank you. Alternates and guests, I've got a message for you today. Morning is coming to Minnesota. <laughs> How many people remember Ronald Reagan's re-election commercial from 1983? Anybody? <clears throat> This commercial said had some simple words. It started out with, it's morning again in America. That's one of the most impactful commercials that we've ever seen. Well, I'm here to tell you today that in Minnesota, we're going to be saying it's morning again in Minnesota. Just as Jacob wrestled through the night, our party has wrestled, and we've walked away wounded, a little bit self-inflicted. But morning is coming. When we remember who we are, our state will truly be the North Star state that leads our nation back to what we know is right and good. So who are we? Well, in 1854, our party was founded by a group of anti-slavery activists. These men and women came together with one purpose, to create a party that would oppose the most horrifying institution that the world had ever witnessed. Revisionists will try and tell us that they tried to stop the expansion of slavery or they wanted to save the Union. If I can just say one word to that, hogwash. We are a party that was founded to end slavery. And we must remember that we are a party that does what's right. Let me tell you the core of my values and beliefs and the basis of all of my policies. I believe that our rights are given by God. I don't, I don't believe that our rights are given to us by government. I believe that the individual is supreme, that the individual is accountable to a living God, and I believe that the state should exercise only that power given it by the consent of the governed.
And I can tell you right now, that belief is not shared by the clowns that are running St. Paul. And we need to change that. The individual must always trump the government. I am blessed to have been a lifelong Minnesotan who is ready to serve the people. Everyone in this room knows that whether it is at the state level, the local level, or the federal level, government is too big, it spends too much, it taxes too much, and it regulates too much. We are ready to be servants, servant leaders, Pam Myra and myself, not to be your boss, but to be your servant. And the reason we're hitting, sitting here on a Saturday afternoon is because we love it too. And we are ready to do battle with the Democrats to make sure that our children and our grandchildren have the type of future that they need to grow, to prosper, to create jobs, to raise kids. We are fast becoming a state where people want to leave. I want us to join the other states that do not tax Social Security benefits or veterans benefits, chasing those people out of Minnesota. Because I think the people of Minnesota are desperate for a leader who will fight the status quo and will fight business as usual in St. Paul, and that's what I will do as your governor. I will fight every single day to change the bureaucratic cu culture in St. Paul from regulate and punish to that of service to the taxpayers who actually pay our salaries. It is about time. I will fight to make Minnesota's business climate actually competitive with the states that surround us. And I will fight, and this one gets to me. You know, I'm not a real emotional guy. I got that from my Norwegian Lutheran grandpa who loved my grandma so much that he almost told her this one time. <laughs> but, but this one gets to me. I will fight those who use our children to promote a political agenda like Common Core or a so-called anti-bullying bill, enough is enough. That one's personal for me. And I will fight to reduce the scope and the power and the size of government, not to slow down its growth, which is what we tend to do sometimes as Republicans, but actually to move in the opposite direction, and, and not through some silly little gimmick like the uncession, read about that, where they eliminated practically nothing of any consequence, and they really left it up to us to undo the things that really could help the taxpayers in Minnesota, like, oh, I don't know, getting rid of the worst governor in the United States of America. I guess they've left that up to us. But, but none of that matters if we can't win. And winning for us as Republicans in this state, it's not about picking the candidate who's been in government the longest or the, or the candidate who can throw out the most red meat or the candidate whose turn it is. Winning for us as Republicans in the state of Minnesota is about picking a candidate who can bring in new voters in every region of the state and who can present a very clear contrasting vision from that of Mark Dayton's. So let me start with the ability to run strong everywhere in Minnesota. First, greater Minnesota. I was born and raised in Detroit Lakes. Sandy was born and raised in Crookston. We went to college together in Moorhead. Our roots, our families, our values are in greater Minnesota. And just as importantly, I now have a partner in this race who has spent his entire life farming and serving his community in southern Minnesota. And big Bill Queasley is going to be an awesome addition to this ticket. The suburbs, I've won twice, actually I've won multiple times, big, in Hennepin County despite my conservative record. And I believe, I believe that's because of my message and I also believe it's because of my demeanor and my personality. I have many independents and moderates who do not agree with me, but trust me and vote for me anyway. And we can use that same formula to work all across the metro area. If I am your candidate, we will take back the suburbs in 2014 for Republicans. So Jeff Johnson's uh, given his endorsement speech behind us. I'm here with Mitch Berg, 
famous blogger, Shot in the Dark, radio host, AM 1280, The Patriot. Mitch, great to see you. Great to have uh, be on with you, Tony. It's been uh, quite a while. It has. It's uh, it was great. It's been a while since we worked on your campaign in 2012, and uh, dying to see what you do next here. Uh, so, what's uh, your impression of these uh, governors' candidates so far? Is it going to be the same way with the U.S. Senate? Is this endorsement going to drag on and on? That's you know, I, one thing I think is not going to. I think we've been expecting it to drag on a little bit, but I think the the, the the factor that dragged on the Senate or caused the Senate race to run as long as it did, the fact that you have so many people from Greater Minnesota kind of protest voting for uh, Dahlberg and to some extent Parrish, is something we already expect on the governor's race because we know that Marty Seifert is really really strong in Greater Minnesota. That's been sort of the conventional wisdom is that Marty Seifert is going to capture most of your votes from the first, seventh, and eighth congressional districts, and that uh, Thompson Johnson uh, between them are going to be duking it out and and for for their power base in the the metro, the traditional Republican areas in the third tier suburbs, and uh, and in the, the the second, third, and sixth congressional districts. So it's it's not a surprise that the outstate Greater Minnesota candidate is going to be a, have his own power base coming into this race, like it was with Chris Dahlberg. Well, so you being a, a grassroots activist, I know that you always have your your eyes and ears to the ground. You know what people are talking out here. Uh, I've heard a couple times some people have said that. Uh, and even Governor Dayton apparently admitted this that to some business community event that if Marty Seifert would have been endorsed in 2010, that uh, Governor Dayton would not have been elected. Do you agree with that? I, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda. The uh, Mark Mark Dayton's ex-wife, Alita Messenger, would have come up with a bunch of opposition research on Marty Seifert, or the Alliance for a Better Minnesota would have done what they did with every other candidate, just make up a bunch of crap and uh, and throw that against him. So it's it's not like he, Marty Seifert would be immune to being attacked with a bunch of scabrous big uh, attack by big money interests on the left any more than Emmer was. I think, you know, the reason why a lot of people read your blog, Shot in the Dark, uh, and it seems that your, your audience tends to be from diverse backgrounds, social conservatives, conservatives, some neocons and libertarians, it seems that you're able to communicate to a broad base of the Republican Party. And uh, do you see uh, the same type of division and vitriol that was uh, going on in, in uh, prior conventions? Uh, you know, if you're comparing this to 2012, no. I think a lot of people who are doing the dividing uh, in 2012 have done what a lot of us predicted. In 2012, they've stayed home uh, in droves, and they're sitting on Facebook heckling the convention today. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, and I think you see... Uh, the, the the change in attitude on the part of the activists of the convention in the fact that Chris Dahlberg, after giving uh, Mike McFadden a run for his money and surprisingly knocking Julianne Ortman completely out of the race uh, on the fifth ballot, uh, went and took the pragmatic approach and handed the uh, endorsement to McFadden, and, and McFadden won by universal acclamation. And that shows that people are concerned with winning the race as opposed to beating their heads against the wall over a principle and then coming up uh, short in November. November. So I think it's a big change in the delegate base uh, over the last couple of years. I've been reading on my iPhone some of the hecklers that you're talking about. <laughs> people saying, oh, I'm glad I'm not at the convention. Or I've read people yeah, uh, saying mutual. they've declared themselves as not being Republican anymore prior to this. Is the party... Uh, better off or worse off with uh, the people kind of dropping out? I wouldn't say better off. I think that the party needs to do a better job of convincing people both in the middle and on the fringe. Uh, and I don't necessarily consider liberty a fringe. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the, the party needs to do a better job of convincing everyone that it has a better solution. So the fact that people are saying a pox on your house and walking away is not a win, per se. I think there's a, a certain minority, a small minority of people who had an agenda walking in and they were never going to be satisfied with anything that didn't involve uh, Ron Paul running for president, which was, in a lot of cases, uh, including you know the, the, the primary agenda for a lot of people, including some people who I respect very deeply. So, so I'll let you get to your lunch here, and I appreciate <laughs> your time, Mitch. Um, 2012 was a mi pretty miserable year for Republicans. I think most honest people can admit that. Uh, there seems to be a renewed energy here in the convention. Uh, the finances are starting to get in order with the party. People seem generally excited. What, in your opinion, is the difference between 2012 
and 2014, and are they going to yield different results in the general re election? Well, I think the, the we're definitely going to see different results because the, the electorate is different. We've had two years of a Democrat monopoly on power in this state, and it's showing we're heading for another budget deficit. The media is not covering that, but we are heading for another budget deficit in the next two years because of the Dayton and DFL budget. Uh, we have Minsure, which has been just an unmitigated disaster, uh, in every definition of the term. We have Greater Minnesota uh, realizing the fact that small businesses are suffering badly in a way that they were not under Republican control. And we have a Republican Party where I think at the grassroots level, there's a pragmatic realization that if we don't learn to play nice within the ranks of the party and bury some of the hatchets in something other than each other's backs and focus on the prize, winning elections this November and changing policy, uh, that we're really going to be screwed blue. <laughs> So this is Mitch Berg. Check out his blog, Shot in the Dark. Also, uh, listen to his radio show, AM 1280, The Patriot. Thank you, Mitch, for your time. Thank you very much. Good you. Honored to be here with Minnesota governor candidate, Marty Seifer. Marty, how's the, uh, how are you feeling? That was a great speech you gave. Ton of energy on the floor. We're feeling good. We got a lot of energy. We great optics, I felt. We put it all together. Video nomination, second introduction. You got to cram it into 20 minutes, and it's not a lot of time. No, it's not, but it, it seems like you have a lot of support, and I believe that you're the only candidate that has support in all 87 counties of Minnesota. Yeah. Why is that? Well, we've traveled extensively. I think we obviously, being from the rural area, we have a lot of support in the rural area because I'm from there. But the Republicans here need to understand that you can't have 15 to 20 counties totally ignored and try to win a primary or a general election. I think people are starting to soak that in. Sounds good. Well, I thank you for your time and wish you the best. You we're, off, we're off to work. Sounds good. That's Marty Seifert. Uh, we just got done with the first ballot count. We're going to hear the results soon. Uh, a lot of people think that he's the front runner right now. I'm going to make a prediction on my own. I think the first ballot's going to be Marty Seifert with 43% of the vote. And I think number two is going to be State Senator Dave Thompson with 24.66% of the vote. Number three, I believe, is going to be County Commissioner Jeff Johnson with 21.2% of the vote. And Rob Farnsworth is going to get somewhere around uh, 5 to 8% of the vote. We'll see. Stay tuned, and we will talk soon. Here we go, they're going to be announcing the results of the first ballot. You can see right back there, they're gonna be announcing. Who's going to replace Governor Dayton? Is this gonna end in one ballot? We'll find out right now. The total votes cast. Votes for endorsement, 1,160. Need 1,160 votes. Farnsworth got 8.3%. Johnson, 620 for 32.07%. Jeff Johnson got 32% of the vote. Seifert, 568 for 29.38%. Seifert with 29.38%. Thompson, 577 for 29.85%. And Thompson at 29.5%. So Jeff Johnson, number one, 32% of the vote. Thompson and Seifert are essentially split right now at 29% and Rob Farnsworth with 8.2. So another close race. Danny, it looks like we're going to be here for a while. Here we go. They're going to read the next ballots. Ballot number two for the governor's race. 1,882 votes cast. They need 1,130 votes. Farnsworth is done. He only got 1%. Johnson, 729 Jeff Johnson got 38.9 or 38.7%. He increased his number of votes. Marty Seifer got 555 votes. Basically got the same percentage as last time. Same thing with Dave Thompson. There is no endorsement after two. So we're in another stalemate, but Jeff Johnson is rising right now. Dave Thompson and Marty Seifert stayed the same, and Rob Farnsworth is out. He got less than 5%. When you get less than 5%, you're out. Does that mean you changed your mind? <laughs> you know what? 
I'm not a candidate anymore. <laughs> well, I guess the first thing I need to do is thank everybody that voted, me, voted for me, that supported me over the last nine months. My dad was here. This is the first big speech he got to see, and I think it went pretty well. So, uh, so this is fun. So thank you. Um, I'll make this, I'll make this brief. You're, you're probably expecting me to stand up here and endorse somebody. And so you're wondering who's Rob going to vote for. And I am going to vote for somebody else, and I'm going to support the endorsed candidate. But I'm not going to tell you who I'm going to vote for. Here, here, here's the thing. I have three kids. I'm going to cry. <laughs> I have three kids that I have to look in their eyes when I get home tonight. And I stood up here an hour or two hours ago and I said, seek God's wisdom on who you should vote for. I didn't say, listen to Rob for who you should vote for. I know who I'm going to vote for. And you need to vote for who you need to vote for. And everything will turn out right. So thank you. God bless you and God bless our great state. Rob Farnsworth, he gave his concession speech. He's no longer a candidate for the Minnesota governor. Classy guy, did it the right way. He didn't tell anyone who he was going to vote for. He said that he's going to support the endorsed candidate. And uh, all around, a classy move by Ron Far Rob Farnsworth. Uh, we are now down to three okay. governor's candidates, and we'll see what happens. Stay tuned. The second ballots were in, as you said, Rob Farnsworth just gave his concession speech, did it in a very noble way. Uh, I'm here with the Jeff Johnson supporter, Joseph Watoon. Uh, Joseph, uh, good to see you. Thank you. Are you uh, having a good convention so far? How are things going? Oh uh, Yeah, I am. It's a lot of fun. So we got the second ballot in, and, and Jeff Johnson was the only one to actually see an increase in the amount of votes that he received. Uh, he went from 32% uh, of the vote to 38 percent. It looks like a lot of the Farnsworth supporters went over to Johnson. Do you think that's the case? Uh, I do. And do you think uh, that this trend is going to uh, continue? Or are we going to continue to see Johnson's numbers rise or, or are they going to level off at this point? Well his campaign and I'm certainly hoping that we continue to see the trend happen. Um, from talking to people on the floor I'm hearing a lot of Seifert supporters who are starting to think about switching I think after the way the convention's been going, people are eager to reach a conclusion and not stall and sit at the same. So with your uh, kind of background with the Johnson campaign, have you seen any bad blood between either Johnson and Seifert or Johnson and the Thompson campaign? I got to say, I think this campaign's been very positive. I think that we haven't seen the type of arguments we've seen in some of the other campaigns, especially between the Johnson and Thompson supporters. From talking to people, I found a lot of people who, have, who support Johnson and have Thompson as a second choice or vice versa. So I don't really see the contention that we see in some of the races. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot here. How many more ballots do we have until we have an endorsed candidate for governor? Uh, I guess three more. You heard it. Thank you, Joe, for your time. Thank you very much. So a lot of people are surprised right now. Jeff Johnson, he is leading the pack of the governor's candidates. Earlier, we saw Rob Farnsworth give his concession speech, a true gentleman, a very honorable speech that he gave. Uh, Jeff Johnson went from 32% of the vote to 38% of the vote. And I'm here with a Jeff Johnson supporter, BPOU chair of SD39 and realtor, Amy Williams. <laughs> Amy, how's your convention been going so far? Well, fantastic now. <laughs> Did you expect uh, Johnson to come out right away in the number one position? I actually did. Jeff has been working really hard for a long time at this process, plus he's really well respected within the party, so he has the roots within the party to do well on that first turnaround. He did a lot better than I anticipated, but I always expected him to come out in the very beginning on top. And what is it going to take, uh, in your opinion, do you think that the Marty Seifert supporters are going to gravitate towards Johnson first, or do you think it's going to be Thompson supporters that crumble and go to the Johnson campaign or, or, or what do you think is going to happen? 
I really think that Jeff will pick up supporters from both campaigns pretty consistently um, and probably in, in like measure. Jeff is, uh, especially we're going to have another opportunity to hear from him after the fifth round of balloting. And I think that when he gets an opportunity to go back up on stage and talk to people, Jeff does an excellent job of connecting with people. And I don't see him doing anything other than picking up votes from the other two uh, viable candidates. And have you been uh, talking to other people on the floor, other supporters of different candidates, and, and are they surprised? Uh, a lot of people thought that Marty Seifert was going to come out above 40% in the first ballot. They said if he didn't, he might be in trouble. Is Marty Seifert in trouble? I think Marty Seifert's in trouble. Um, I never thought that he was going to come in as strong as his supporters believed he was going to. Um, I think people are ready for a candidate that really reflects their values and reflects our Minnesota nice, and Jeff is that candidate. I'm not saying that Marty isn't. Marty is a very hard worker, and there's a lot of respect for him within the party, but he's just not Jeff Johnson. And Jeff Johnson, Jeff Johnson is what our party needs and what our state deserves. Well, you heard it, Amy Williams. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks a lot, Tony. Take care. Jeff Johnson surprised a lot of people with his first two ballots. 32% in the first, increased up to 38%. Marty Seifert, State Senator Dave Thompson, basically stayed the same from the first to the second ballot. I'm here with Jeff Johnson's running mate, Mr. Bill Queasley. He is actually a native of this area around Rochester. Bill, very nice to meet nice you. To meet you. Nice to meet you. How uh, were you surprised with uh, Jeff coming out number one in the first and second ballot? Well, of course, with this convention, there is no predictions. I mean, after the last day and a half, uh, you can read the delegates. And I, I think Jeff knocked it home in his speech, his, uh, his video, and definitely his commercial. And one of the things that we're showing is that you can really come across and saw our message, and that's the Republican message, by having also a sense of humor, and that's what Jeff and I both have. And that video showed that, and our commercials showed it. And I think that that's why uh, people are coming to our side now. Well, there, there's a lot of people uh, walking around energetic, but they also got kind of saggy eyes because a lot of us were up real late last night or early in the morning and had to get up early in the morning in our hotels. And well, the behind the scenes of this is that we had to take Jeff out of here yesterday because his voice was going. And we knew very much uh, that his speech was going to be one of the home run hits that we needed. And so they brought me in yesterday, and I, between shaking hands and, of course, my voice, you probably hear it now, is starting to go. But I think it's great that we, uh, we're, we're ahead, and I think we can pull this convention together and get out of here and maybe a couple more ballots and uh, head home and then uh, head on the road and uh, win in November. So we, we heard last night from some of the U.S. Senate candidates, uh, Chris Dahlberg, for instance, saying multiple times how he's going to honor the endorsement and how he's going to honor the, the will of the delegates. Jeff Johnson uh, has said the same thing from the very beginning, that he'll honor the endorsement. And do you think that this is one of the reasons why uh, he is doing pretty well right now? I do think it is. Uh, I think with the McFadden Dahlberg race, there was different dynamics there. Uh, McFadden definitely has the personality, but he also has the money behind him. And I think the delegates were kind of looking at that. Uh, this race is pretty much even when it comes to money and all that. And so I think it was more down to the personalities and Jeff's and myself. We're trying to get across so we can sell that message with a smile. And it's not a smirk, but it's, it's telling the people of the state that there's a better way of doing business than what the DFL is offering. And we're not that mean a, and a Republicans. Uh, and we're going to show that, that we're going to care about the state of Minnesota. Can you share with everyone uh, what your uh, background is and then also sure. your, your past relationship with Jeff? Did you know him prior to... Uh, when he started to do that? Yes, I served in the Minnesota legislature from 2000, excuse me, 1996 to 2004. The last four years I overlapped with Jeff, so that's how we got to know each other, and that's why Jeff remembered me. And uh, the last two years I served as transportation finance chair. I also served on taxes and ways and means, and I uh, worked on just about every conference committee that had to do with those issues. And, uh, you know, I was kind of the go-to person in the legislature, uh, both the Metro I was able to work with them, and I was also able to work with the Greater Minnesota representatives and senators. Uh, it's it's quite an honor. I mean, that people remembered that and came to me. Uh, you know, Jeff could have picked a whole lot of other people, and I'm hoping I'm bringing something to this ticket. I think I do. Uh, I got to go out and sell that now. And with Jeff and I, uh, hopefully, winning this convention, 
I think we can do that. And Bill, last question, not to put you on the spot here, but I want your prediction. How many more ballots until we have an endorsed governor candidate? You know, after the last uh, 24 hours, I'm not going to say. Uh, it's all on who stays here and uh, when we can get out of here. I'd like to say two, but uh, I, I don't know. If there's big movement this time, I think it'll move rather quickly. I'm talking, you know, if we hit over 40% uh, and move towards 50%, I think it's over with rather quickly. You heard it. If there's big movement this time, it's probably going to go quickly. And if it's uh, relatively the same, you better start drinking coffee now. <laughs> Bill, thank you for your time. Thank you. Good thank to you. meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm here with former state senator Ted Lilly. Ted, it's great to see you. Tony, great to see you. Thank you for having me on. So what have you been doing to uh, keep yourself busy? Well, actually, I've taken on a role as the president of the Taxpayers League of Minnesota since September, and that's a great role. It's wonderful to do that after being a state senator previously. So what kind of uh, work are you doing, and, and what's the interactions that you have with legislators? Well, actually, the Taxpayers League of Minnesota it really is the, is the right side stop on looking for uh, free enterprise, limited government, uh, reducing spending, and finding a way to hold the line on taxes. Because really, the, the question is, how much are people going to have of their money at home and in business, and how do we create jobs and keep jobs going? So that's really what the Taxpayers League is doing. We work with the legislators on the, on the issues that they are working on at the Capitol and how they affect the families. Uh, so we watch them. We have a scorecard that we keep track of what those votes are. And uh, that'll be coming out uh, later this summer. So we'll have it available at the county fairs and at the state fair and places like that. So how would you, uh, we just got done with the last session. How would you rate that in terms of uh, from a taxpayers league uh, perspective? Well, you know, it's interesting because the governor and the DFL leadership at the legislature are saying that they've given this tax break back to the people of Minnesota, back to the businesses. But it's almost like they stole all four wheels off the car and, and took those wheels away. And then you should feel good because they gave the hubcaps back, but they didn't give them back to you. They gave them back to somebody in Minneapolis. You know, there's some uh, there's some clever Democrats out there that, you know, they didn't vote for the taxes, but they voted for the spending. Yes. Do you guys look at that combination or are you strictly looking at just taxes? Yes. No, Tony, we absolutely do look at the spending because that's where it comes from. We don't have the need for the tax unless we, we have the need for the spending. Uh, so, again, efficient delivery of government service is what we need to work at. And that is something that the DFL has not done. Uh, there were a number of measures that were in the legislature in the previous sessions. Uh, that they undid. So when they talked about the on session, what they undid is some of the absolute reform that was there to hold the line on spending. And uh, so we're here about to uh, maybe see a governor's candidate endorsed by the party. Based on their records, uh, does the Taxpayer League, uh, I know you guys don't endorse candidates, but you obviously examine records and how would you rate each of them? Well, uh, I think I think it's interesting. I, th I think that there are three great candidates that are still in this race today. Uh, they're all very fiscally conservative, and that and that's a blessing for the taxpayers, the citizens of Minnesota. Uh, Dave Thompson has had 100% score in our previous scorecards. Uh, he has signed the pledge in the past, I believe. Uh, Jeff Johnson, when he was in the legislature, also held the line on spending. Uh, and he also, uh, on the county board, Hennepin County Board, has been the lone fiscal voice uh, protecting the taxpayers. Uh, Marty was in the legislature before also, and I, he's had a pretty good score. Well, I'm certainly glad that we have you as president of the Taxpayers League, keeping a track on everything. Is there a website that people can go to look at these scorecards? Yes, taxpayersleague.org. We'd love to have people join us. The other thing I want to mention is that the DFL party is meeting in Duluth this weekend. They're endorsing Governor Dayton again. Uh, Governor Dayton, on the other hand, has not held the line on spending and has taxed people. So we had a $600 million deficit, projected deficit. They they raised the taxes $2.1 billion and now they gave back $400 million. It's not the same. We did not, we filled the hole too big uh, and we're taking too much from all the families of Minnesota and we can do better. Taxpayersleague.com. State Senator Ted Lilly, thank you so much. It's great to see you. Have a great convention. Thank you, sir. We're fortunate enough to be with the third guest ever on the Tony Hernandez Show, State Senator Roger Chamberlain. Roger, it's great to see you. Great to see you again. Third guest. That should be a prize or an award. We were, we were actually in the, the smaller studio at the T Tony Hernandez Show, and we graduated to the bigger one. But, you know, I can I can say that you were there at the, at the very beginning, and I'm proud to say that. I'm proud that I was there. That's great. I'm glad you're still doing it. Wonderful. Yeah, you remember we had uh, the little basketball player on there? 
Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. A small child, yes. So anyways, we're, we're about to get to the, uh, the third ballot here, and uh, I think Jeff Johnson surprised a lot of people by, by coming out so strong in the first ballot, gained even more votes in the second. It seemed like probably a lot of the Farnsworth people uh, gravitated over to Johnson in the second ballot. Do you think that's what happened? Yeah, it's exactly right. I, yeah, I think Johnson did surprise people, but we were also thinking that if there was going to be a problem or an issue or competition for uh, Dave Thompson, it'd probably be Johnson. One of the uh, issues that State Senator Dave Thompson talked about in his speech was education. And it's not something you hear too often in Republican conventions. Uh, it is an important issue, and do you share that same passion that he has for education reform? Absolutely. I think we've referred to it the civil rights struggle of our time. Uh, the conditions in uh, many of our schools, especially Minneapolis St. Paul, it's immoral, and it needs to be addressed. So we need drastic uh, reform that breaks from the past. So that's what we're trying to do is, and Dave is trying to do, I would say, I don't want to speak for him, but drive some positive change and really uh, cut from the past. New creative ideas that's really going to bring positive solutions for kids. So uh, Dave Thompson was able to get almost 30% of the vote in both ballots. Uh, can you tell everybody why do you support Dave Thompson for governor? One word, why? A lot of people will tell you what they're doing to run for. Uh, healthcare, education, uh, budgets. He tells you why he's running. Because he truly believes in people. And every day he's come to work, I work with him all the time. I've worked with him for four years. He comes to work. He comes to work doing everything he can to improve the lives of citizens in this state. He believes in people, he believes in the state, and he believes in people and uh, respecting people. That is the best way to solve our problems. So that, that's why uh, I support Dave and that's what I believe about Dave. One thing that I was very impressed with was State Senator Michelle Benson. Seems like uh, she's got uh, uh, she's well liked by a lot of people. Have you had a lot of interaction with Michelle? And can you tell everyone a little more about what it's like to work with her? Well, I, I think I consider myself and Michelle good friends, close working friends. Same with Dave, and Michelle's the same way. She's smart. She's bright. She's intelligent, and she's um, she's. Uh, very sensitive to the issues out there. She has a great way of communicating with people and connecting with people, but it's been a pleasure and honor for these four years of serving with and work with and for uh, Dave and Michelle. So, Roger, you went from the majority in the state Senate to the minority, and it's probably a different game working uh, in the minority. People are, have been asking me, are, are you planning on running again? I, I will decide what I want to do after this election. I got a couple of years yet to decide. And I'll have to see what happens here with uh, 2014 in our state house and governor's race. I'll see where I am at uh, financially with the family. It certainly seems like there is a different atmosphere, different energy from 2012 to 2014. What, what do you think the difference is in terms of the party and the activists? What's the difference between what happened in 2012 and what's going to happen in 2014? Well, I'd, I'd say we've been working very hard on changing the marketing and messaging. The major difference is this year we have a plan. The Senate, the House, the GOP, we've been working closely with them, all three of us, all three organizations, and with outside groups to create a smart, effective, um, smart, effective messaging communication plan and strategy going into 2014. That's one. Number two, what we're doing is that what's happened is that the DFL and the governor have given, have done a lot of harm to Minnesota. Uh, it's impacting a lot of people, so that's given a lot of, uh, a lot of energy to this, uh, this campaign and this convention as well. So last night people were here till about 2 in the morning, they get back to their hotels till 3 in the morning. Uh, what's your prediction? How many ballots are we going to go until we have an endorsed governor's candidate? And also, are you prepared to go the distance? Well, I don't know. It's not going to go 10 ballots, I don't think. We only have three candidates. They're very close. There's momentum on one side. People are getting tired. They want to go home. So it's not going to be 10 ballots, I don't think. And uh, whatever it takes, I'll be here. I'll stay again. State Senator Roger Chamberlain, great to see you as always. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you very much. Pleasure, Tony. A pleasure. Thank Good you very you. much. Take care. So uh, we just got the results from ballot three in, and uh, these are the results. Jeff Johnson got 44.5% of the vote. 
Marty Seifer got 27.6% of the vote. And Dave Thompson got 27.6% of the vote. And now Dave Thompson is going to be giving a special announcement. And you know what that means. That means he's going to be conceding the race. Uh, it looks like this is going to be a two-man race for the fourth ballot. Jeff Johnson versus Marty Seifert. Stay tuned to see what happens. You know, I suppose it's uh, kind of odd for a guy who cut his teeth in the political world the way I did to say talk is cheap. But talk is cheap. There comes a time when you got to do what you say you're going to do. On June 26, 2013, I got in this race. Shortly before that, I had spoken with someone by the name of Tim Pawlenty when I visited Washington, D.C. He told me, Dave, win or lose, this will be the experience of your life. And it has been. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's been a long weekend. I'm not going to keep you here very long. Besides that, I'm kind of a believer that brevity is the soul of wit. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's kind of depressing to a guy like me when the loudest applause I get is when I say I'm going to stop talking. But, <laughs> all right. I want to thank you all, those that have voted for me, those of us that have supported my opponents, those that have taken the time to ask me questions and listen to my explanations. You truly are the people that make this party work. Make no mistake about it, it's a great party. Thank you. I could keep going, but I see no reasonable path to victory. And I don't want to even attempt to lock this convention up, because I believe today what I believed on June 26th when I boarded that plane to do my fly around, and that is that the best chance to beat Mark Dayton is to unite behind a candidate on June 1st and support that candidate with everything we have. And so if I may, if I may, at the risk of upsetting some people, which I've never done before, but I suppose it could happen. You and me. Let me ask my opponents who have not agreed to abide by the endorsement to think about it. I've gotten to know the five gentlemen that have been my competitors over several months. I've grown to like and respect all of them, some of them I knew before. And obviously, it is well within everyone's right to run in a primary, and I don't deny anyone their right to do that. But I don't think anybody in this room would say that Jeff Johnson is not qualified to be the governor of this state. I believe primaries are there as a safeguard against a reckless decision that can occasionally happen because politics is a weird business and those of us who engage in politics are weird. <laughs> however, however, our party system is important. The decisions we make are important. And if we walk out of here tonight with a qualified candidate, and by the way, so is Marty Seifert, we all know that. He is qualified to be the governor of this state.
I would implore, I would implore my opponents to think about whether running in a primary is for the good of the cause or for the elevation of self. The purpose of a political party is to unite behind qualified candidates and beat the people that have a bad view of how government should operate. So I, I've told many of you out here as I've tried to get you over to my side that I respect each and every one of you and I respect your individual judgment. There's no reason you have to support the candidate that I want you to support. You are moral free agents and you can do what you want. But I've gotten to know Jeff Johnson. Not only that, I've gotten to know the people that work with Jeff Johnson. We see their staffers on a daily basis. Jeff Johnson is a gentleman. He's a man of character. He is qualified to be the governor of this state. I believe he can be, beat Mark Dayton. I would ask my delegates with all due respect, and those who choose not to do so, I absolutely respect and defer to your judgment to support Jeff. Let's leave this convention tonight with an endorsed candidate headed to November. Let's beat Mark Dayton. Thank you and God bless. So State Senator Dave Thompson just asked all the delegates that voted for him to stand behind Jeff Johnson. He also called out uh, whether or not uh, people who were pledging to continue to run in the primary, whether doing it for principle or for self, it was a really powerful moment. So uh, he's withdrawing from the race right now, sending his support behind Jeff Johnson. We're going to a fourth ballot. We're going to see what happens after the fourth ballot. You all stay in touch. We'll keep you informed. First of all, I want to thank all of you for the immense amount of time that was put in this weekend. We had to wait a little bit for the Senate race, obviously, and judicial and other things going on. We are blessed to be in the most beautiful state, in the most beautiful country on the face of the earth. The United States of America has blessed me and my family to seek this opportunity to run for governor of Minnesota twice now. I think everyone here agrees that we need to listen to the grassroots. We need to listen to the activists who trudge so through. There's some breaking developments now. We we're all ready to vote in the fourth ballot, and Marty Seifert is going to make an announcement. Make he's right behind me right party. now, uh, talking about what his plans are, what he's going to do. I so tonight, he's sounding like he's kind of choking up right now, and uh, we have a we'll just wait and see what happens. Awesome convention. And I want you to congratulate yourself for that. I want to let you know that as I decided to run for governor and we were building the cancer center and I waited probably too long to announce and I get that, that a lot of people made determinations and a lot of people made decisions and I respect that, that decisions were made. And as we worked extremely hard in the short amount of time we had, the grassroots in February said Marty Seifert's our top choice. Four years ago, in an eight-way race, the grassroots who trudged to the caucus rooms in 2010 by an outright majority in an eight-way race said Marty Seifert is our choice. Now when I got into the race today, and when I got into the race in November, everyone in this room knows that I was not triggering a primary. We had two other gentlemen trigger a primary before I ever got in the race. And everyone in the room knows that. And they're good men. And Dave Thompson, Jeff Johnson, and Rob Farnsworth are good men. And we ought to appreciate that. So as I look at respecting the grassroots, when two cycles in a row now the grassroots have said Marty Seifert's our top choice for governor, 
as I walk around the convention floor and I now see delegations that are either entirely empty, half full, two-thirds empty, particularly in rural Minnesota where they got to get back for church or baptisms or funerals or weddings. And I look at the quorum count go down now where we got probably four to five hundred people who are not here. I want to respect your time because it's precious and you sat here last night and you endorsed someone who said they were going to the primary anyway. And I respect that in endorsing Mike McFadden because he is a gentleman. And all the other candidates that ran for the U.S. Senate are fantastic candidates as well. And we ought to respect them for what they decided to do. <laughs> knowing all of this, knowing all of this, instead of dragging things out, taking your time, keeping you here, making you rent another hotel room for another night because you spent a lot of time and money already, and God bless you for doing it, I am going to decide that my delegates can be released to go home and go get your sleep. I know some of you have six or eight hour drives and we have people particularly in seven and eight who have left already. And we've got hundreds and hundreds of people that either couldn't come or decided to leave early. And I want to respect that. So as if you hand out another ballot, that's fine. But I'm realizing that we have a lot of people who have left and who are leaving. And so for the rest of you who are here, I want to respect you for that and not drag this out any longer than it needs to be. I have told you all along I have been open-minded to a primary, knowing that Kurt Zellers and Scott Honor are going to a primary anyway, and I know this upsets a lot of people. I, am, I have decided I am going to head to the primary to be one more person in the primary with the other two. As, as so people, the latest news is Marty Seifert has just decide, announced, he told all his delegates that, that they, they should go, go home. home like He's got delegates you. throughout the entire state of Minnesota. Some make seven, eight hour people. drives. He told them all to but go home. And he says that he's going that to continue in the primary. Uh, Kurt Zellers if you want to stay and vote, Scott Honor, they're both already that. said that they're going to go into the primary. Stay, uh, Marty's fine, telling everyone that they can stay and vote for the endorsement. But Marty Seifert is going to continue to run in the primary. God, he wants you. to be the next governor. You. He's telling God everyone to go home. So it looks like Jeff Johnson is going to be the one who uh, ultimately gets endorsed. But Marty Seifert, his campaign is not over. He is going to continue and bring this to the primary. It is going to be a four-way race in the primary. It's going to be Jeff Johnson, Marty Seifert, Kurt Zellers and Scott Honor uh, all vying for the primary and who is going to take on Governor Dayton in November. Is this going to make the candidate who ultimately wins that primary and goes to the general election stronger? Is it going to make the party stronger? Is it going to give Governor Dayton another term? We will not know until November. And that was pretty incredible announcement from Marty Seifert. I'm sitting here with Rick Aguilar. He is the chairman of the Hispanic Assembly of the Republican Party. Wow, that's some drama right there. Well, you know, Marty got into the race late, and, uh, you know, I was a supporter. And, you know, the, the, the fact there's going to be a primary was already set in stone. So, you know, that's Marty's decision. But Marty has been a favorite out there. And so I'm, think, I'm thinking that, you know, for the good of the party, Let's go to the primary. Yeah, and to Marty's defense, he was on our show maybe six months ago, yes. and I asked him specifically. I'm like, Marty, Kurt Zellers, Scott Honor, they're running in the primary. You got in this race a little bit late. Are you going to uh, run in the primary if you don't get the endorsement? And he said the path to victory is the endorsement, then the primary, then the general. Exactly. He said he's going to run in the primary. So he's been up front about this the whole yeah, time. And, and the fact is that everyone in this race knew that was going to happen, so I don't think there should be any bad blood here. That was, a, that was set in stone already. But, yeah, I, but I'll tell you what, on the, on the other side of it, Tony, what a great convention for the fact that we have the minority supports there. You know, the affiliates are great. We've had some great speakers. We're beating up the Democrats.
on the fact that you know they haven't done it right for these populations. So I'm really excited about the future. Yeah, and there's no doubt that the energy this year among the delegates and the activists, it's it's nothing like 2012. No, 2012 no. is a, a chapter in history, and the future of the party is... Well, I want to thank you for running a couple years ago as one of our Hispanic you know, candidates, Tony. Well, I still have the fire in my belly here. So. Well, of course you do. And this, and your program, congratulations. Anything we could do together, my friend. But, I, but I'm feeling we're, we're turning the corner on Republicans realizing that we do have some issues that we can work with with the Latino community and with other multicultural groups. That's school choice, big time. Economic development, there. So I'm excited about the future. Absolutely, Rick, and, and I got to thank you as well for all the work that you do, bringing in new people into this party. We need new people, new blood. I love doing it, Tony. I really do, and, and it's going to pay off. It's going to pay off because we're we're there now, and I think there's going to be other members of the community are seeing. Hey, you know what? I think Tony Hernandez and Rick Aguilar had something there. You know, we we don't want to be in, in in a cycle of poverty and dependency with the Democratic Party. You know, this is America. And you've been a success. I hopefully that you know I've worked hard on my life. And we came from just the, just around the corner, just in the neighborhood. So I hope we're kind of not role models in a sense, but but looking at it as, as as some stories that other people can relate to. Absolutely, our message is that you can make it. That anybody can make it in America. Exactly. Democrats' message is the world's full of victims so we'll and racism. Exactly. So thank you for your time, okay, Rick. Buddy. Great seeing you. Okay. Drive safe home as well. Okay, I will. Take care, Thanks, Tony. Thank Take you. Bye bye. Thank you. All right, so that was a pretty uh, dramatic uh, conclusion to everything that happened. So the first question I have, Chris, is a bunch of the delegates left. Is there a minimum amount of people that need to vote in order for an endorsement to happen? Yeah, there is, and the chief teller, Dave Osmick, is going to look at that as he's counting the ballots right now and see if we have the quorum needed to endorse a candidate. And from a party leadership perspective, uh, what, are your, what are your feelings about everything that just transpired? I mean, ultimately, look, we want what the delegates want. Okay, and I believe this delegation wants an endorsement, and we're here to facilitate that process for them. <laughs> and, you know, there's a number of uh, candidates that have already said they were going into the primary. Marty said he was going into the primary. So I guess it shouldn't be uh, that big of a surprise, right? Well, look, from the party's perspective, we are going to be 100% behind where our delegates are. They want an endorsement. Uh, it's clear that they're about to endorse a candidate. Uh, we hope that that is in the works already with the counting of the ballots. And when they endorse, when they uh, give their last word, that's where we will be. Sounds good. Well, uh, thanks for the updates, Chris. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thanks, Tony. Um, but the reality is we're going to have a primary. And so my focus, again, is going to be on Mark Dayton and explaining to Republicans why I'm the strongest candidate to actually beat him. And I think I think we will come through that just fine. And uh, we'll have a we will have a... I think we're going to have a really strong message because I've got a really good contrast with him to present to general election voters. And what's your message to cipher delegates? So some of whom are, are, you know, a good number of whom are with their candidates and say, he, you know, he did the right thing. Some are. Um, I would say many, if not more, talked to me afterwards because they stuck around and they said thank you and we're supporting you because we believe that this is a good process. Um, but I will, I will talk to the ones who left, um, and some of them might have left because they wanted to be with Marty. Some of them might have left because they just wanted to go home uh, because it's been a long couple days. Um, but I, I will make the case to them that I'll, I'll make to every other Republican that I'm the strongest candidate. I think that I have a stronger base throughout the state of Minnesota, rural, suburban, and even urban. And uh, I don't think the other candidates can say that. That's that. So it's been a great convention. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, thank you for coming and, and spending the time to watch our show. Again, we broadcast live every Saturday on SCC Television Studios and also SPNN. My name is Tony Hernandez. May God bless you. May God bless America. And vaya con Dios.